Our guest today once said, what you think is what you say. What you say is what you do. And what you do becomes your legacy. Today on the Champion Forum podcast, we have a guest that went from picking up walnuts straight to Wall Street. Get ready as we dive in to discuss what is sure to help you transform yourself and your team through the power of belief, operational effectiveness, and leadership. Brandon Dawson is a business scaling turnaround expert and leadership mentor who helps business owners and their teams achieve their personal, professional, and financial goals through growth of their businesses. He founded his first business, Sonus Hearing, at the age of 26 and was one of the youngest people to ring the bell on the American Stock Exchange. With zero debt and no outside capital, he then founded and self-funded Audigy Group, growing annual revenue to over $35 million through organic growth. He exited the company for $151 million. He's achieved numerous awards in business, such as achieving the Inc. 500 and Inc. 5000 fastest growing companies five times, the Oregonians top 100 workplaces three times, and EY's Entrepreneur of the Year finalist twice. Today, as CEO and co-founder of Cardone Ventures, Brandon coaches Cardone Ventures clients using his proven leadership and business strategies as the foundation for strategic growth that empowers them to follow in his footsteps and create their own legacies. Brandon, welcome to the Champion Forum podcast. Thank you. And thank you for having me on your show. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Well, I have uh, I have followed Grant's work for quite a while. Uh, I've been to many of the conferences. Uh, look forward to being to many more in the future. And uh, I, I've looked at the work that you're doing with that organization uh, but I want to go way back uh, to to maybe where it began, and my research tells me that maybe you got a little uh, got into a little mischief with your parents, and they gave you uh, a chore to do as a punishment when you were a teenager. Tell us about this walnut incident and how it got you thinking and helped you get to a place where you ring the bell to open trading at 26 years old, grow a business from zero to 150 million, and now the CEO of Cardone Ventures. It all started with the task of picking up walnuts. Yeah, well, you know, I I, I only uh, was a good enough student in high school that allowed me to play sports. And so my parents told me if I didn't maintain a C average, I couldn't play football, baseball, basketball. And, and that's the only thing I actually liked about high school. I hated actual school. And because we didn't have a lot of money, I had to work. So I did football uh, practice. I go to school, do football practice. And then uh, I would work at, at, at a restaurant as a bus boy or dishwasher in, until midnight. And my junior year, I, I met this girl I liked that was going to Oregon State. She was a college girl. So after I was done working at the restaurant, I'd sneak over to her house and my dad caught me violating my my <laughs> curfew. And so they were going out of town and he told me that as part of my punishment on all my free time, I needed to pick the walnut orchard. And we needed $5,500 a year from the walnut orchard to put me and my little brothers into this private Christian school for tuition. And they relied on it. So it was an important thing, but but I hated the walnuts. I hated them with a passion and my hands would be stained for six oh, weeks yeah cold and rainy anyhow so so that's where my epiphany of becoming an entrepreneur found its way into into my body yeah i uh i read the story that uh the task was so big that you uh enlisted the help of some other people and uh that was kind of your first go at uh, how to scale something right yeah i i went to school and i saw a note on the locker saying senior fund drive they were trying to raise a thousand dollars for the senior trip my parents had already left town. So I had this idea. I went to the head of the senior class and I'm like, hey, if you guys want to earn some extra money, come help pick up some walnuts. Because I thought if I could pull time forward and get the walnut orchard done, then the following weekend, I'd be able to buy some time to go see my girlfriend and <laughs> before my parents got back into town. So the number one motivating and inspiring act as my first uh, entrepreneurial seizure was so I could spend time with my girlfriend. Hey, you know, we always say uh, in business or in the pursuit of success, one of the factors that can never be denied is how to engage your motivation, right? Whether, yeah. you know, it's, it's a girl or whatever, like we'll run to what's important, right? 
Exactly. So uh, looking at, at your body of work, Brandon, it is it is amazing, uh, you know, to go from that, you know, humble beginning and doing your part to help put yourself through school at a young age to what you've accomplished is no small feat. And uh, you've dedicated your life literally to helping others learn those principles and take people with you. And in, in the, the, the Champion Forum podcast is dedicated to entrepreneurs. It's dedicated to leaders, leaders that aspire uh, to become leaders, as well as the top executives in the world. And one of the biggest challenges in any business is scaling. And uh, as you know, scaling a business, it's going to require sound leadership. It's going to require management systems, whether it's financial management, teamwork, motivation, learning. Uh, a business is only ever going to be as efficient as the systems that it has and the systems we implement. You've learned things the hard way. Uh, you were forced to sell your company at one point by investors. What are the common scaling mistakes that you see? And how can uh, the entrepreneur, the leader that's listening, how can we avoid them? Because you've touched the stove a few times. What are you seeing, Brandon? And what's your advice to these folks that are scaling and all the things that come with it? Yeah, great question. <clears throat> so 31 and a half million businesses in the United States that are under $100 million of size. There's 31 and a half million, 97.8% will fail within the first 10 years. 10 years. Two thirds will fail in the first five years. The average median income of the average entrepreneur is under $78,000. And of the 31 and a half million small to mid-sized businesses, 25 million have a single employee, which is the founder. And, and so really, really the, 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 the issue here is, is that you've got 6 million businesses that are, that are trying to, to thrive. Uh, and in a lot of cases just survive. And so the, the mistakes, one of the things I wanted to understand, and I experienced um, these mistakes by buying 120 businesses in 36 months and taking them public and trying to manage all the aspects of buying and integrating cultures and operationalizing and systematizing and hiring executives and hoping that they're going to do their part and work together as a team. I just learned it doesn't really work that way. Um, and, 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 and there's an old saying my brother used to say, there's the way there's the way you'd like it to be. There's the way it could be. There's the way it even maybe should be. But we live in a world that is the way it is. And so what I decided is instead of be a victim of those circumstances, when my private equity group did a forced sale um, in 2002 with my first company, right when we were getting ready to take off, but they had a chance to get all their money back, plus all their internal returns before any investors or other shareholders, including myself, made any money. And they took that they took that. Mm -hmm. So I decided I was going to re-engineer how businesses are built uh, because the three reasons businesses fail reported by all these entrepreneurs that fail is first, no demand for product or service. Second, can't find good people. And third, can't get access to financing or funding. Mm -hmm. And I decided I was going to reinvent how businesses are built. And I could, if I could figure that out for myself by self-funding it, not giving any control away, then I could teach other business owners how to do the same. And that's where I pivoted my attention in 2004 when I started my last company. Yeah. And, uh, you know, no, and that's critical. And those statistics are really staggering. Uh, but just like every good business is we're looking to solve problems. And, and literally that's what you're doing. And that's what Cardone Ventures is doing is solving some of the problems around the statistics that you just mentioned, which is amazing. Because uh, here I am on the on the same journey as a solopreneur after 24 years uh, carrying the bag in the corporate setting and so forth. And there's a lot to learn through that. Uh, but I mean, you didn't just fall on top of the mountain. Uh, there were times that you also were carrying the bag. You've had amazing sales experiences. I've heard your stories about going, uh, you know, throughout the southeast and of the United States and, you know, going from door to door, literally uh, in medical device. Talk to us about that journey. I mean, you didn't just show up where you are now. Uh, you were in this company. Uh, your wife's pregnant with your first child. And you said, hey, um, enough's enough. Like, I got to make a leap. I got to do something different. How do you ride that tension uh, of yeah, well, getting from that to where you are? So the best decision I made is when I graduated high school, I did not want to go to college and I did not want to stay in Corvallis, Oregon. And, you know, my friends were saying you should get a job at the local you know, tire shop, or you should get a job, you know, at the local 
mill. Uh, you know, you're you you you're not really that smart. You know, you're 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 you you know you're not that great of an athlete. You, you're just an average guy. So don't have these big dreams or big hopes. And the best decision I made was to ignore all that, be willing to leave uh, home, and I moved uh, from Corvallis, Oregon, to Atlanta, Georgia, and I became an outside sales rep uh, for a device company. And, and it really forced me to learn how to do things that I never cared about in school, like read maps or figure out addresses, or it sound, might sound funny to people today because you can just tell Siri where to go and it'll take you. But back then I had to figure out how to like manage an atlas and then yeah. go into every town and then figure out what streets are where and navigate. And, and, and then I had to go call on doctors and try to sell hearing aids and <clears throat> take money and transact the business and fill out expense reports and things that at 19 and 20 years old, you just, you, you know, you usually go into college being told what to do. Right. And, and, and so I happen to be really super good at sales and I happen to be really super good at figuring out how to get in front of people. And so I became one of the top sales rep for this company. And, and I moved to Minneapolis as an assistant sales manager. Now I got fired from my boss in Atlanta and spent six months figuring out how to live on my own. And then they rehired me back because there was a, some circumstances that were out of my control. And so, you know, I, I just learned to survive. And I think that's one of the things I would tell uh, anybody has been the best thing for me is I had the courage I could survive. Mm -hmm. So fast forward, I'm 26 years old. I've got a newborn and I've got a two and a half year old and a brand new home and my wife and I'm making 150 grand a year sitting around a table with a bunch of 60 year olds making less money than I'm making. And I asked the owner of the business, like, how do I make more money? And he's like, you already make more than everybody else. And so to me, I went home and that was an epiphany. I'm like, wow, I'm not going to be here 30 years from now making the same money I make today. So I was like, I got to go do something that I can control. And I saw a trend in the industry where our clients were shutting their businesses down to retire. So I thought, why not try to buy some of those businesses and keep running them. And that's that's the transition. December 15th, 1995, I resigned my position, moved, sold everything I had and moved my wife and two little babies to back to Oregon. And I started talking to business owners. Hey, instead of closing your business down, why don't you sell to me? And found my first one to say yes, four months into the process and parlayed that into a public company. There we have it. Just like that. I mean, hey, listener, just do those things. You're, you're going to be amazing, right? But there's a journey that comes with that. There's pain, there's risk, there's there's all of that. And many of the people listening, they're they're riding that tension right now. Uh, and there's probably people listening that are contemplating making the same leap that you made. Um, but either way, business, ex they exist to solve challenges for people, for communities. It's how we communicate the value, I believe, that matters. And I've heard you speak about this quite a bit. And I think, you know, you, you just told us the statistics around how many businesses fail. I have found in my own consulting business and helping small businesses grow that it's rarely the product that's the problem. It's rarely the service that's the problem. They're pretty good at this stuff, which is why they decided to do a business anyway. But the, we, we find a, a, a challenge to solve. Uh, we find a community to serve. But then we lack how we communicate the value. And I think that's what really matters. Brandon, how do we best communicate the value of our business to influence others to make the buying decisions, which are things that you said you have a knack for and you're pretty good at getting in front of people and you're pretty good at sales? What are those things and how do we communicate the value of our business so that the world knows and we don't become the best kept secret? Yeah, this is in reflection, you know. Uh... Steve Jobs did a talk on connecting the dots. You know, this is in reflection. This is where looking backwards, you realize some of the different things that you experience and what you learn from it if you're paying attention. And, and that's where these darn walnuts come back into play, because I, I I thought if I could free a few days up to spend time with my girlfriend. So I approached the senior class. They had notes on the locker saying they wanted to do a fund drive to raise a thousand dollars for the senior trip. And so I went to him and said, hey, if some of the guys want to come out or gals want to come out and help me pick up walnuts, I'll donate some money to the senior class. And so that next morning, I thought a few people would show up, but it ended up being a caravan. And, and we 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 picked that walnut orchard clean, just precisely clean within three days because all the family members were there. Now, I hated these walnuts. It made my hands orange. It was an embarrassment every year. People would make fun of me. But I noticed something when people were out because I didn't touch the walnuts. I had so many people out there doing it. I was driving the tractor around and having them throw the husks in the back, taking them to the burn pile, dropping them off, coming and picking up the walnuts, taking them over the dryers. And, and I never physically had to do anything. 
and so in reflection, there's some lessons I learned there, and and, and I think they apply directly to, to being an entrepreneur. And the first is, the more people you throw at solving a problem that are aligned with you, the easier it is and the faster things get done. So why would you ever want to do anything by yourself? That That's lesson number one. Lesson number two is I hated those walnuts. And, and many business owners go into business and then they end up hating the thing that they do because it overwhelms them, their family. There's always problems. Um and, and when owners start their business, they start it by talking about the what they do. So I'm a plumber or I'm an electrician or I'm an insurance or I'm a doctor and uh, you know, I'm a chiropractor or I'm a dentist. And they talk about what they do, what they do, what they do. Another second very important lesson I learned with these walnuts is as much as I hated the walnuts, all these people were enjoying and having fun picking these walnuts up. <laughs> and the reason they were is because the family members weren't there because of the walnuts. They were there to show their kids that they loved them. Yeah. And and sometimes business owners need to understand the impact of what you do is more important than the actual physical thing that you're doing. Yeah. So you sit and promote what you do, what you do, your product, your service, your product or service, and you get objections. But I would say that you should tailor your conversation to the impact of what you do and the benefit it for the people you do it for. Yeah. And 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 that's why business owners get trapped. And then the third lesson I learned out of the walnuts and Grant Cardone says prices are made up. And it's true. See, I didn't know how to run a calculator. I didn't know how to calculate. I was horrible in math. So I just made a price up. And those parents paid that price. And my parents every year needed fifty five hundred dollars from those walnuts to pay for our private school. And that year I raised eighty five hundred dollars because I made up a price. The parents paid it. And and the, and the third lesson is price is only an issue in the absence of value. The value wasn't the walnuts. The value was the parents showing their kids they were supporting them. Yeah. So learn to market your business to the benefit of what your business can create for somebody else and not get distracted or bogged down in what you do. And so three lessons, price is an issue in the absence of value. So create massive value in your price proposition. Prices are made up. So make up the prices that will best support your value proposition. The more people you throw at things, the faster they get done. And, and you know, that, that, that those were lessons later in time. I was like always remembering, why am I doing this alone? Why am I doing this alone? If I had more people, it'd go faster. Yeah. And so I learned those lessons early on, thank God. And I just kept applying them throughout my life. So I think what I heard you say is focus more on the problem that you solve than the actual product that you sell. Exactly. And like, yeah, you don't need to tell somebody when, when somebody says, what do you do? And you say, I'm a dentist. You don't need to tell them what you do as a dentist. You, you need to ask them what would that person benefit from that would dramatically or drastically improve their life by yeah. having a smile that they would love to have. And how could they help facilitate that? And if somebody okay. wants something bad enough, they're not even going to ask what the price is. Yeah. Yeah. The last thing we ever want to do is to get into price wars and, you know, low cost provider. But unfortunately, a lot of small businesses go that way. And especially startups, I believe, Brandon, because they have the fear of losing. Uh, and I think what you're saying is spot on. And it's something if you are a startup or you are scaling, like think about this and think about working on the, the problem that you solve and work backwards, re-engineer that so that your go to market strategy you can demand a higher price. Um, so I talked a little bit about, you know, I'm a business consultant and I, I get to be a part of a lot of industries and a lot of different uh, companies. Uh, and I work with a lot of companies that are scaling, primarily small businesses that want to be medium. Many of the organizations that I work with, uh, they're fighting to grow. And one of the most common pitfalls I see is that entrepreneurs are working in the business when they need to be working on it. And this is primarily uh, the small business as well, because you know they, they don't give a lot of autonomy or they feel like if they give it away, nobody else will do it. And they get stifled doing the busy work. What risk does this present? And how? what would you say to business leaders to be more intentional about making the change to work on the business versus in it as they're scaling? Well, I mean, so so I, I did a research project from 2009 to 2019, and I did it with FTI out of Chicago. It's a billion dollar consulting firm, and then refreshed it with IGS out of Boston, which is another consulting firm. And 
we what we did is we looked at thousands of ind individual verticals and industries and did surveys of business owners and entrepreneurs to understand what causes businesses to break, what are the failure points, what things would they or could they have had in place based on the ones that succeeded. And so that that created uh, what I call the break point um, um, structure. And, and so what we found is there's natural break points in business. And break point one is 100,000 in revenue to 3 million. Break point two is three to eight, then eight to 15, 15, 25, 25, 45, 45, 75, 75, 125, and I can take that up to 4 billion. And we identified what elements were in place that allowed the business to succeed, what elements were not in place that caused it to break. A slip back is when you go from like break point two to break point one, you go from four or five million back down to two or three. A snap back is when you go from like 15 million back down to three or four million. It's usually, usually catastrophic. Now, to take the statistics of 31 and a half million small to business-sized businesses, 25 million have a single employer, which is the founder, 5.6 million have between two and 12 employees, and only 600,000 have greater than 12 employees. Mm -hmm. So that means 5.6 million businesses, statistically with 12 employees, and we looked at revenue per employees on average and all these things. What we found is that basically 90, uh, let's see, 90... 8% of all businesses under 31 and a half million of those businesses have less than 12 employees. So either one up to 12. And so obviously break point one is 100,000 to 3 million. And that's where almost all business owners get stuck because it's easy to hire a few friends. It's easy to have control around the business with a handful of employees. It's easy to be inserted in all the conversations when you only have five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 11, 12 people. But when you start going to 30 people and 50 people and 100 people, it gets unruly if you don't learn how to structure your organization and how to orchestrate it and manage it in order to get the highest version of people you put in areas of responsibility and measure the impact and overall effectiveness of the work that they do. So what happens is as businesses start to take off, they may be growing this huge 15 million, 20 million, 30 million, 50 million. We see it all day, but then they they snap back. They crumble under their own weight because they didn't have the right support structures in place. And so what we've done is engineered all those different elements of the support structures. So you not only need to know what needs to be in place for where you're at, but what's the next iteration of growth. And what I find is business owners talk about the things they, they don't even need to worry about for six or seven breakpoints later until they're 50 million or 70 million, but they're not even addressing the things that they need to have in place at 2 million. So for me, it's like having business owners understand that first and foremost, you can only get so big working by yourself. This goes back to the walnut story. Then you got to throw people at things in order to help you. But at some point in break point one, when you transition from break point one, which is 3 million to three to 8 million, it becomes, it starts with the what you do has to work. But when you move from three to 8 million, who you do it with has to work. And you can still kind of manage that. But from 8 to 15 million, how you do it with the who you're doing it with, with the what you're doing has to work. Mm -hmm. And that's why most businesses get stuck is they can get the thing they do to work but they don't know how to develop the teams to take it to the next level by working with the teams and then working with the teams to create process procedures and systems to get it to 15 million. And then yeah. from 15 to 25 million, it's a whole new game because, because now you're adding a lot more people, you're adding more complexity to the business. And, and then at 25 million, you got to switch how you do everything to a different type of accounting, a different type of management. And this is why so many construction businesses fail so fast is that they just don't understand what all the structural elements that need to be in place are, and then they reinforce and make sure they're there. And this is the adage of, you know, I, I know how to make an amazing apple pie, so I'm going to start a business. But as that business scales, this apple pie maker doesn't have a clue. They don't know how to lead. They don't know how to scale. They don't know processes. So there's a lot of things uh, in regards to what you just said, but if you were to like boil this down to a couple of things that the listener could take back and say, this is my watch out. Is it leadership, Brandon? Uh, is it leadership development? They just don't know how to lead people. They're great apple pie makers, but they don't know how to lead. Or is it the timing of bolting on these processes you're talking about? It's, 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 it's the total sum of all of that. So, so look, you know, when you first start your business, 
um, you need resilience as an entrepreneur to succeed. And, and so let's say you have an idea, you start doing something, you're uh, using the e-myth version of, of, of the conversation with being a baker or something, you know, you, 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 you get good at what you do, the what works. Okay. Um, but unless you're going to burn yourself out, you're going to need to get the what to be bigger than what you're doing or the business is trapped because you are the business. And this is the working in versus on. Mm -hmm. And, and so you have to be conscious of the fact that in order for the thing to create value versus just create an income, it has to move from you doing the doing to other people doing the doing and you working with them to replicate what you did. Mm -hmm. and, and that's moving from me leadership because it's already hard enough to start a business, get it working, get it going, promote it, actually do all the labor, do all the work, and then hire your first person, hire your second person. That's already hard enough. That takes resilience. But then to pull yourself intentionally out of being the one doing any of the doing and working and developing people in each category of the doing, so you create a system around it, that isn't the competency that allowed the person to become an entrepreneur. So having the resilience in me we leadership to get it started, but then having the resilience to pivot to we leadership. So from yeah. me to we um, is difficult. And then you have one more technical move you have to make at 15 to 25 million. You have to go from me leadership to we leadership. Then you have to go to us leadership because now you're inner reliant at 15 million. There has to be three leaders in the business. You need to you need the, the the leader, you need the the manager, and you need the person that's the builder. And those are three different people. And you can get away with being all three of those people up until break point two and break point three, but eventually it overwhelms the system and the weaknesses in the system. And John Maxwell talks about law of chain, and that's what he's talking about. You're only as good as a strength of every link in your chain. And <clears throat> so when you take what Gerber talks about me myth, which is you do it and do it and do it and do it. And then you create a little process and then you teach other people and then you quality control what they're doing until you can create a system where you're not there at all. Yeah. And, and that's the thesis of EMAT 40 years. It's still been true, but now you have to evolve and to evolve. You got to understand good, great, great, by choice, how the mighty fall. I might see a few of those back there where, where you got to understand why big corporations crumble and fall. It's because complacency in the leadership lines People are protecting their positions versus being chartered with building out new leaders in their organizations. And so as a business owner, you got to like assimilate all that information. And this is where 21 irrefutable laws of John Maxwell, you like, you need to apply those 21 laws. And then he's got 17 laws of teamwork and 15 laws of this 53 laws and in evolving and developing as a leader. And you got to learn those laws because if you haven't mastered them by the time you're at 25 million, you'll have a snap back and it'll be catastrophic for sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you, you know, the everything rises and falls at the hand of leadership. But it's like once I get that right, I forgot the other lever I gotta pull, which is the processes. And then the other one that I gotta pull, which is sales and growth and strategy. And so obviously it's not for the faint of heart, but that's why guys like you exist and uh you're out there helping us. Now, I do want to um you had briefly mentioned this before, but I know this is also a subject you're very passionate about and one that can derail a startup or somebody with the big dream, you spend a lot of effort helping folks obtain capital. And you talk a lot about this. And you referenced it uh, without referencing it earlier about your first company. And I know the story about you talking to the guy and then he writes the check for a million bucks. This is clearly an area that if done wrong can be at best cripple a dream and at worst stop it from ever happening. I've heard you talk about this strategy through the four P's and the four M's. Talk to us a little bit about that and maybe some of your personal journey in gaining this capital without, you know, taking out loans and all this other stuff. Yes. Yeah, so my first company was all private equity backed. I raised my first million and then I raised 6 million and then I raised 18 million and I raised 10 million. And then, you know, but when you're raising money with third parties or other people, you're now beholden to the, not only your dream, but listening to them. And when they have control of your company, now you're at their, their decision and discretion as to what to do with the company. And, and so the, the P's are promote, uh, you got to promote, there's seven promotes and you got to learn how to be the, the number one promoter in your business. And then it goes from promote, you got, you, you, you got to know how to make money. So, so you got to learn how to make a profit because my belief is if you do, if you build your businesses correctly, you don't need other people's money. And that was what I wanted to 
prove with my second company is that I can build something without using anybody else's money um, other than people that I can serve. And then I'll make them my partners because now, now we're, we're collectively bound by a core mission to work together. And that's what I did. And when that business sold, one of the pride, proudest moments of my life is I wired out $45 million of the sales price to my customers. I was the first guy that equitized. Um, and now you have blockchain and you have security tokens and you have all these things that are happening in the marketplace. But I equitized and used my customers as my shareholders and investors by providing services and, and, and deliverables to them, helping them grow and scale. And we won together. And that's really what I wanted to do. And every employee that worked for me, I paid out $15 million to every one of my employees at the sale because I wanted my employees to win together. I wanted everyone to feel like we were building this together. Wow. And I believe that's what business owners are missing today is, is that they think they need to do it all themselves. So, so to me, it's really uh, teaching a business owner that if your picture is big enough and the success is big enough, you make room for other people to succeed inside of your success. Yes. And so applying personal, professional, financial goal planning to your employees and then showing them how to achieve that through your business is working on the business versus in the business. Because if you align people with the right thinking that do the right doing, which is your responsibility, and you have them reward from that collectively as you reward, then you get everyone pulling you to success versus you as the owner feeling you're pushing everybody to success. And we've seen that thousands of times over and over and over. And it's what I love. And it's why I do what I do every day. Uh, you know, I created enough net worth that I don't have to work again. But the fact is creating that for people who trust me, work with me and creating it for clients to trust us and work with Grant and I is something I'm extremely passionate about. And it inspires me to get up seven days a week and go out and crush it in the marketplace. Yeah. So obviously Grant is a household name and this, I mean, this is amazing feedback and it's definitely something that no entrepreneur is excused from this at all, especially those that are wanting to scale, or there might be those people that they don't have the capital, but they have the best idea. This teaching may be, you may be just this one podcast episode away from diving into Brandon's teaching and getting it from a dream to reality. And and obviously Grant is uh he's become a household name. We know him from the the television. He's all over social media. I mean, here you are. You're you're you go from picking walnuts. You're opening the bell. You go from zero to 150 million. You're a serial entrepreneur. How did the connection with you and Grant? How did this happen? Um, and what has that journey been like? Yeah. So so in 2009, I talked about all that research I did and, and, and in 2016 sold the business. And then I integrated the business and led the charge to take the company that acquired us from $1 billion to $4.5 billion in 36 months. In 2019, I was ready to start taking all that research and figure out a different way to go to market and build my next iteration of helping entrepreneurs grow and scale using innovative technologies that were coming to emerging to the marketplace and and all the concepts and technology I had built. And, and so I was looking and talking to all my traditional private equity group friends and, and funds of funds and family funds. And, and I really didn't want to do it that way. I wanted to work with the single independent entrepreneur and my wife, who's half my age, a great asset to me. She's she, I wasn't on social media at all. She suggested that we look at some of these social media personalities. And so I started looking at them with them. And I was quite honestly, extremely disappointed with the majority of them because there's so many of these guys out there, no matter how big they are, that are really just selling the concept of listening to them and being more uh, excited and reading and, and, and they don't really do much. And, and so I was frustrated because they would make these promises and then I'd go look at what they're doing and it'd be like, this is just, you know, a lot of promotion, not much substance. And so she made a short list um, and, and I started looking at the top people and we came across Grant and Elena. And at first I didn't like Grant at all because I watched, she showed me one of his YouTube channels and it was like, hey, 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 Grant Cardone, <laughs> the money gun in front of his airplane. Yeah, right. I'm like, okay, this is, this is a joke. So, so, <laughs> so my wife, I, I refused to read 10X rule and I refused to, to, look, re, watch anything. And, and I was look, continuing to look on. And then she came to me and she said, Hey, um, you know, this guy's got a legitimate sales training business. He's raised several hundred million dollars in crowdfunding. Don't just look at the promote, like actually look what he's doing and see, I was kind of shut off to it, which is a warning to everyone that you, your first inclination isn't always your best inclination. So she actually made me start watching Elena Carter. Wow. And I was like, 
all right, now I'm seeing a different side. Mm -hmm. Well, I went back to my research company and I said, hey, we have all these hundreds of industries we want to go to. This Grant Cardone dude does sales training. How many industries is he doing sales training in that match to the industries we've done research on? And they came back and said 63%. Wow. So I told Natalie, hey, let's go. We bought tickets to go to GrowthCon. Nobody knew who we were. I brought, I bought second row tickets facing the stage. I've run a lot of events. I knew I wanted to show up with no one knowing who I was. I knew I wanted to show up understanding what kind of clientele were there. I knew when we showed up, I wanted to see if he could really pull this off. I wanted to understand, is there areas of the business that we could actually complement? And then I wanted to understand, could we like Grant and Elena? And then the most important thing for me on that short list of very important, relevant indicators I was looking for was, can Grant's, is Grant's net worth, I'd already achieved, overachieved my targeted net worth that my mentors were talking to me about, 50 million, 75 million, I was worth 100 million. And my next target was 350 to 500 million. So the question was, has Grant achieved enough net worth that he's already over that because I know that those that can't do can't can't really teach you there's a lot of bullshit right. that's why I didn't waste my time in college you sure. most of these most of these business owners go and talk to the wrong people and get the wrong advice the wrong guidance talk to the wrong consultants talk to their lawyers talk to their accountants and they never learn to ask the right questions to understand should they even be talking to that person about the things they're curious about so mm -hmm. here's a rule i have don't talk to anybody who hasn't done what you're trying to do yes. because otherwise they're going to derail you from the because they don't know yeah so you get false data and then it establishes a false belief a narrative and then you take false action or take no action and then you never find it so right so I went in looking at this stuff and and we checked every box the first half of the first day, met so many great 10X community people, listened to Grant. I was really intrigued and 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 his, his, his what he talked about was spot on as far as I was concerned. So after the the convention, we made a stepped in to take a picture and I said, Hey, you know, uh, uh I've seen and heard enough to make a decision. I'd like to tell you that I think I could add a couple billion to yours and my net worth by helping the people in your community here doing things you don't currently do. Um, and as a credibility check, I sold my last business uh, and I just finished with it for 150 million. And he was just told the day before by John Maxwell, who spoke at the event, John pulled me up on the side stage, pointed me out and said something to Grant as they walk off stage. And I had dinner with John that night. And he said, I told Grant, if he had a chance to meet you, that anything you tell him is the truth. And he wow. should, because I've worked with John. He's been a mentor of mine first through his books then in real life at doing events together, then I helped him in his business. And then he's helped me in my business. And we've developed a deep, loving relationship. And so another lesson is you just never know when the dots are going to get connected where other people are going to help you. Yeah. So always treat everybody like they're the next person that's going to help you. That's amazing. So that was clearly the, the Miami event. Yes. In 2019. Yeah. I wasn't far from you. Amazing. Maybe, maybe we fist bumped. I don't even know. Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> I mean, I was just like, wow, I cannot believe he got all these people to show up and, and meeting wonderful people like you. And I was just overwhelmed with how cool everybody was and what they were trying to do to accomplish. And the 10X community is the perfect community for me because if you want to be mediocre or average, you're not in the 10X community. Yeah, the energy there was unbelievable. And the, the lineup was out of this world. So uh, I'm definitely a fan of what you're doing, Brandon, and uh, of course, uh, what Grant is doing. Uh, I know we're coming up on it with time. Do you have time for a speed round for us? Sure. Yeah, let's go. If you could have dinner with anyone, dead or alive, who is it? Elon Musk. There we go. Good one. Good one. He's busy lately, right? Yeah. If you had a billboard that everyone in the world could see, what would it say? What you think is what you say. What you say is what you do. And what you do is what you're known for. There we go. The opener of today's show, right? I, I thought that might be it. If you could only recommend one book to everybody in the world for them to read, what is it? The next rule. There you go. One daily routine that has made the biggest difference in your life. Who I spend my time around and talk to. There you go. I loved what you said earlier um, about your, your relationship with Grant and how that came about. And what I think I heard you say was get around people that have been where you want to go. And uh, you're that you're that guy for a lot of people too, Brandon. So we appreciate the work that, that you're doing for sure. Yeah, thank you. And be around people who are willing to help you get to where they've been. 
Like, There's a big one, right? Because not it's everybody. Uh, as, it's as important. And the other thing is, look, I, Grant and I launched this business 40 months ago, and the new enterprise is already worth a half a billion dollars. We'll do $90 million this year with over a billion two under management. And, and, and I just will say to you, if you get around the right people who are willing to help you and you're willing to listen, and there's a price to be paid for that. And my price was, I told Grant, I'll give you half the company. I'll put your name on my shirt, swallow all the pride and, and, and let's work together. Sometimes you got to make hard decisions to get where you really want to get to because the people you need the help from aren't going to do it just because you're a nice person or you're begging them to. And so what I would tell you is collaboration is a more important currency than any money you'll ever make because who you spend your time around, who you get help from and who you can help will accelerate everything in your life. So good. So good. This is valuable time and valuable information. Uh, we appreciate you joining. But before I let you go, tell the listeners, how do we tap into this? How do they connect with you and the work that you're doing? Yeah, the easiest way I tell people is go to at Brandon M. Dawson on my Instagram because on there, we're always promoting what is next. We're promoting what all, where we're going. We're promoting who we're doing things with. And it's just, it's, and it's being updated five, 10 times a day. And we're in different cities. Sometimes I'm in six or seven cities, Grants in six or, we have a boot camp here in Scottsdale. First time ever, we'll have 600 people this week. At, so if, you, if you're on my Instagram, you're going to see that stuff and you're going to be able to say this is for me or that's for me. Or you can go to CardoVentures.com and, uh, and, and check us out or GrantCardone.com. And, and, uh, but if you want to know where I'm at, what we're doing and what all is going on, the simplest, easiest way is at Brandon M. Dawson. And we will have all of that listener in the show notes, every social link to Brandon websites. It'll all be there. Make sure that you don't miss that. Brandon, is there anything I should have asked that I didn't? No, but I will leave everybody with this thought. Uh, the faster you can convert your thinking from how do I help other people to succeed by working with me and make their success your focus, the faster you're going to surround yourself with higher quality, higher ambitious, higher inspired people to do the work with you. And don't get hung up if you're challenged with that right now. Just pivot how you're thinking about people and what your responsibility is to help them succeed. And you'll find the right people to help you. So good. So good. Well, listen, we'll have all the links. Brandon, thanks again. All the socials, websites, show notes. Make sure if you want to get these sent to your email, register to get these sent right to your inbox every week. The website right on the homepage, jeffhancher.com. Until next time, keep scaling, keep making a difference, and never forget that you all have been set up to be champions in this life.